And we are back on WGN TV Political Report. You may have seen this map earlier this week. With just about 98% of the results in, it confirms what we've known about Illinois for a while the big divide between the Chicago region and the rest of the state. Now, the map shows you which candidate leads in each of Illinois' 102 counties. Lots of red on the map for Darren Bailey, but as some point out, land doesn't vote. And you can't win a statewide race in Illinois without getting a decent chunk of the city or suburban vote. We're a state of 12 and a half million people and nine and a half million of them live in the Chicago area. The other problem that continues to confound Republicans in Illinois is ending Democrat control of the state house. Bill Clinton was president in the 90s, the last time Republicans were in charge of House chambers in Springfield. 2010 was the closest Republicans got in the last 25 years. Some of that can be attributed to the Democrat drawn districts every 10 years. And this cycle was no different. Democrats are only expanding their majority in the state house. There's still a couple of races too close to call, but they're on track to pick up uh, five seats. That means they can continue to hold a super majority and the GOP is relegated to the back bench in Springfield. The minority party, they're in for some changes after Tuesday's losses. House Republican leader Jim Durkin, he's stepping away from his leadership post and I spoke with him just after that announcement on the future of his party and what's next. And joining me now is Minority Leader Jim Durkin. Thanks for being with me, Mr. Leader. My pleasure. Thank so, you, Paul. So, um, we had that announcement from you, and I, I just want to start by asking, is the decision based on you, you made it, or has there been pressure on you to step down from members? No, no pressure from members. I have, and I continue to have support from the membership. I talk to them on a regular basis, but I just made a decision in myself after this year's primary that uh, there's a certain threshold that I had to hit uh, because at the end of the day you're judged on how many seats you win. That's really more, really extremely important and I fell short and uh, I made a decision that it's time for me to move on. Uh, I've made my contribution but uh, I'm satisfied with my, my, my career but I, but I left under my own terms. Uh, well in that I, case, did you hear from members saying, don't do this Jim, stick with it? I had some people ask me to do that but I just told them that I think it's time for us to uh, pass over uh, the reins to uh, some new blood uh, with new ideas, a fresh face. Uh, I've done everything I could during my term to be uh, a positive influence in Springfield and also to help uh, win seats and we you know it came up short but I know it's time to leave and the thing is everybody knows when it's your, your time and you know this was it. So I have to ask the natural follow-up question which is is this also going to then lead for a depart to a departure from the legislature for you or this is strictly about leadership? Right now it's leadership and I haven't had a chance to really decide about whether or not I'll continue on in that capacity after I'm, I'm I was elected to serve another two two years, but my wife you and serve I, out that term. You know that's something that my wife and I are going to decide within the next few weeks. Um, it's a lot for us to absorb after having this being part of my life and her life of walking away from this position as a leader. So we're going to take that in stages. Uh, I just have to decide where my best role and where my greatest contribution will be towards the Republican Party. So this was the first general election post Madigan, right? And um, and the messaging from Republicans of kind of the the you know the the Democratic fear monger, you know, be careful, they're you know they're going to come for you. That just didn't resonate with voters. So I'm no. sort of curious, especially in the suburbs, I'm sort of curious your view. Do you give Democrats credit for that? Is this about Republican taking some blame? How do you evaluate it? Some things are just out of our hands, and as we found out, we thought we had a, a the, the red wave hitting us, and it didn't didn't occur. Uh, we had complications, uh, obviously, at the top of the ticket, uh, Senator Bailey, who is very conservative. He's very good for his area, but up here in the suburbs and where the votes are cast, it just didn't translate into success. We were running against Donald Trump. We were running against the Dobbs decision, uh, and also a heck of a lot of money, which we could not compete with the Democrats. So every commercial was a Democrat state representative or a state senator pounding away the issue on, uh, on reproductive rights. And it was very difficult to get our message out regarding the Safety Act and also accountability on uh, finances, ethics, uh, and scandal. Were those the right issues to pick? And I, I know you know the WGN polls that were done. And, and so as you know, crime wasn't, <laughs> it was number four on the survey. Number one was the economy. Did we need to see more efforts from Republicans on the economy? I believe that the economic issue was a national issue that uh, was going to uh, run its own course. And in Illinois, uh, J.B. Pritzker got a $13 billion bailout 
from uh, Uncle Sam, and he claims that now he's got austerity and his uh, decision of how to finance it, the state are going to be run, but we're going to run off the cliff in a couple of years. But he had every advantage uh, going for him. It was not because of any great economic policy that the state is doing a little bit better, but when your dad cleans out your credit card, and, and, and you know, you know, you start again. But the thing is, I'm afraid they're going to blow it out again. So I will just say the economic issues were more of a national issue that I was planning that would be more of the that that was going to take a life of its own. But when it comes to public safety in the suburbs, we all have known somebody who has had a terrible experience in the city of Chicago, whether they have been held up or they've been carjacked. And people are afraid still to come into the city of Chicago, people who work in the city, people who live in the suburbs. And I felt that that was still a strong issue. And as I spoke to countless groups over the past year, in my eyes, it was very important, particularly in the areas that we are competing. So it, it, it appeared clearly that very few people in, in leadership stood publicly behind Darren Bailey and his run. We didn't see a lot of that. So if you're going to rebuild, what is the path? How do you address the, the, the Trump-type conservatives who exist in the state versus the moderates? What You've got experience behind you, and with that comes wisdom, they tell me. So, so what, what is your advice for the party moving forward? Well, just look what happened on Tuesday and understand that in politics and in government, you win with addition. You win with addition and not subtraction. We have been in the game of subtraction because we have held candidates to this far-right extreme principles under the platform without the slightest bit of moderation. We need to have more moderation with our candidates, candidates who will reflect the districts not that have to play and kowtow to the platform and also to the far right. In the suburbs, people look at things differently on firearms, on Second Amendment, on, on, and I would say even on reproductive rights or uh, issues on same-sex marriage. These are, these are suburban issues which people want to see Republicans not taking a strident far right position. I know that. I've lived in the suburbs my whole life and we've lost a great number of people who I believe were or hold Republican economic principles very strong and they believe in the Republican Party, but they've gone too far and they've, people, they've left the party because of a far-right extremism and also Donald Trump doesn't help us either. Well, when I listen to you, it, it makes me think back to the Rauner years because th this state will elect a Republican as a governor. It's exactly. done that. Exactly. And, and so when you think of, of somebody like Rauner, they became chaotic years for him, but nevertheless, given his views, given his positions, um, but did the Rauner years hurt the party's chances moving forward in a subsequent election? Well, I think that uh, the governor took very, he had positions. He was uh, not very good at finding compromise, let's put it that way. and. Uh, the governor took this approach that you have to run government like a business. It sounds good, but it's not exactly translated into success. He was running against Republicans who found him more moderate or a rhino, like me, that were not willing to embrace everything that he was asking for. But the governor, I think, just went around, Governor Rauner just went about running state government the wrong way. And you know, you've got to be able to, no matter what your feelings are towards Republican, Democrat leaders, Republican leaders, Ultimately, they're the ones that control the votes and will control your agenda. So going in and, uh, you know, uh, vilifying and, and, and making all kinds of accusations against the Democrat leaders is not going to move your agenda. You've got to play the game. You've got to be able to say that, look, I need to, I have three or four things that are important for me. Let's find a way to get them done. But when you make it personal, and that's what happened with Bruce Rauner, with Madigan and Cullerton, in hindsight, yeah, yeah I think he was right. But the fact is, at that time and place in Illinois, you've got to be able to, you know, look away and just say, I'm prepared to work with you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, and let's get some things done. But you just can't say that they're this and that and expect to get any results. Well, let me tell because, I mean, I think you kind of fall in the, the mode, uh, as I view you, uh, maybe a Jim Edgar uh, Republican or some of those throughout the years. Yeah. So my question is, if you were governor, if you were governor uh, going forward, uh, how, what would you do to work with Democrats? They still going to have super majority. Got, what would you do to work and make things happen? Well, for one, uh, they know that I have uh, the ability to, even though with their super majorities, they don't have, I wouldn't say that their super majorities are all aligned. But when the governor has the ability to veto, you can force some people to take your side and you have a lot of authority to be able to hold on to vetoes if you don't like, if the Democrats are going to run roughshod over you. But I will just say that 
I, I, you know, you've got to look at it from what's right for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the whole state, not just the Republican Party. So when we take on social issues, if it comes to me, I have to balance not what's the party, what is the party's responsibility, what does the party want me to do, but what's the right thing for the state? I voted for the Equal Rights Amendment four years ago, and I got in a lot of trouble for that, but I was a Republican leader, but I stand by that. I voted for an assault weapon ban three years ago, again, but that's what is right, it's responsible, and I'm looking at what I think is right for the state of Illinois, operating in moderation, finding a way to negotiate and find common ground. I mean, whatever happened to those days? Those days are over. You've, but the thing is, Republicans need to understand that to have a seat at the table, you gotta have addition. You've gotta be able to win seats. And you win seats by looking at the areas which we're competing. Do we have the right candidates that fit the description of the district? Not just Republicans, but for independents, moderates, even soft Democrats. That's what we have to do a better job of. I thought we were, did a pretty good job this year, but we were just overwhelmed financially, but also the fallout at the national level from the Supreme Court, but also Donald Trump. Leader Durkin says he isn't putting his weight behind anyone to take his place just yet. His advice for his successor, keep your door open and don't shut anybody out. Still to come, a path to victory for the Workers' Rights Amendment, where the votes stand when we come back.